comes to Dr. Gary Parker. Okay, well, it's uh, always a special treat to, for me to be here with you, and congratulations. And so I understand that uh, Brian, in addition to working with the uh, Rocky Mountain Creation Fellowship here, is also uh, signed on to be a uh, speaker with Answers to Genesis, is that right? Yes. And so uh, I know uh, they'll keep him plenty busy, so you guys will be sending another missionary uh, out into the field. And uh, on behalf of the uh, Creation Adventures Museum down in Florida, uh, we're happy to be one of the one of the early ones, right, to sign on to the Creation Weekend program, and we intend to follow through with that. And so I think Bill Browning, would, you kind of spearheaded that idea, uh, and that started here to kind of spread around uh, the country that we I encourage churches and uh, you know educational units around the country uh, to plan at least one Creation Weekend celebration a year. Uh, and uh, partly, uh, I'm not opposed to having a second one. Uh, in February, when uh, you know an enterprising uh, person about a couple years ago wanted to do an evolution Sunday in the churches, <laughs> uh, the Sunday nearest Darwin's birthday. Well, Darwin's birthday happens to be Abraham Lincoln's birthday, and uh, so that uh, uh, had quite a different spiritual outcome than Darwin's journey did. And so we might have a mid-year break for a Sunday and then another creation weekend. So I encourage you to continue uh, the tremendous outreach that you have. And you can get behind the leadership, but I think the Denver area really needs one of the ICR rate conferences, radioisotopes in the age of the earth. So it's been my privilege to be the general speaker uh, for the scientists that present this, uh, you know, fantastic uh, evidence uh, directly from radioactivity uh, studies and so on in favor of young earth. Well, this evening, it's uh, my pleasure to talk to you about plant power. Uh, is one title that we gave to this. Uh, pardon me just a minute. I'm almost exhausted from talking with my son-in-law. <laughs> All right. Um, another way to title this would be Capitalizing on Chaos. And so that's the one I kind of use in classes. And of course, you people are the ones that actually like, you know, these kinds of talks that I don't get to give to anybody else. And uh, I actually went out of my way this afternoon and handcrafted, okay, for your enjoyment, entertainment, and information. <laughs> okay, a fantastic, one-of-a-kind uh, diffusion box. Okay, and so there is, whoa, already warming up. Okay, I was going to tell you, there it is at absolute zero. <laughs> okay. And so if you think of these little uh, black spheres that you see there uh, as water molecules, uh, this would be water molecules or any other, uh, you know, particle, even subatomic particles. Well, at least atomic particles at absolute zero, uh, by definition, is a time when there's no motion of uh, atomic particles from one place to another. I guess even at absolute zero, there's some internal vibratory motions, but no translational motion, no going from one place to another. Now, well, what happens if you add a little heat? Okay, you begin to warm things up. And wouldn't that be a nice idea? Okay. <laughs> and so, of course, I'm fresh from Florida. <laughs> yeah, I told Bill I brought a young man with me from Florida to help me do some work uh, in the California house. And he, one of his prayers was to see snow while he was here. <laughs> uh, see, it's his fault. <laughs> so he's got that answer in spade. But at any rate, we'll add a little heat. And adding a little heat produces a little molecular motion, you know, from place to place. Now we need to add more heat. Uh, and you say, well, what's heat? Well, heat is molecular motion. Uh, well, what causes molecular motion? Well, the answer is heat. And you may notice a fundamental circularity there. It's really kind of impossible to define heat and molecular motion separately from one another. Uh, but that's kind of a general tendency. A lot of things, you know, you just have to accept. And it looks like one of the fundamental features of our universe is that uh, small particles are in a constant state of random, chaotic, bump into each other motion. And that motion can be slight, if you're just a little bit above absolute zero, uh, to being so violent that it strips, uh, you know, the particles away from the uh, atomic nucleus. 
And at life temperatures, the so-called biokinetic zone, a very small range between absolute zero and the you know temperature of stars and things like that, uh, you have this nice, pleasant place we call home, uh, where you have uh, you know solids where the uh, particles kind of vibrate in place, and liquids, which is kind of what I'm illustrating here. Uh, where, you know, particles will flow around among one another, bump into each other, but don't really jump up out of the container. And then gases, where they would jump up out of the container and spread out, you know, much further. <laughs> and so this is kind of the area of our common experience. And so you can think of these as water molecules. Okay. Uh, well, you may notice, uh, you know, this dividing line here. I uh, handcrafted this very afternoon. <laughs> okay, from a fantastic piece of cardboard. Okay. Uh, and uh, there's some pores in it that you probably can't see. But I've got a semi-permeable membrane. That is a uh, membrane with some holes in it that lets some things through and not others. Uh, well, in this particular case, uh, water molecules can move easily through this membrane. And if I start off uh, with a situation where all the molecules are on one side, uh, we could think of this as a membrane of a living cell or, or about anything else like that. And I just add some random molecular motion. Uh, you know, you can see what happens. And so right now it's a little lopsided on this side with one, two, three, four, five on this side, so there should be, there's 12 total, seven on this side. And, uh, and now let's see, one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> one tie, okay, one stuck in the middle there. Uh, but you can kind of get the idea uh, that on average, there's gonna be, uh, you know, six particles in this side, six particles in that side. Uh, it's interesting, now this phenomenon here, just the tendency of molecules to scatter out uh, due to random thermal motion, uh, is called diffusion. And in, in one sense, you'd say, well, diffusion's random chaotic. You know, it moves things apart, it scatters them out. But if you've got a relatively confined space here, notice that even a random process, uh, that is the individual particles are behaving in a random way, uh, actually uh, produces some very predictable results. And so if you have water molecules freely able to go through a membrane in a couple of confined spaces here, the individual molecules, if you could number them from 1 to 12, uh, you know, one might be on this side, then it'd be over here, then it'd be over here, then it'd be, you know, back and forth, back and forth. The individual particles would be constantly changing place, and yet the process of diffusion would be moving in a definite direction. Well, what definite direction is that? From high to low concentration. And so if you've got them all on one side, so there's a high concentration, there's a lot of them over here, a few of them over there, diffusion will scatter. Now, I can bring them back together uh, to where they're far more scattered out. How long would I have to shake the box until all 12 of the particles were back over on the right side and stayed there. Now notice, million years, billion years, gazillion years, <laughs> infinity, it doesn't make any difference. The process doesn't move in that direction. They might momentarily, all 12 of them wind up here, but by the time you said, oh, they're all, they'd already be scattered out again. And so this process of diffusion goes from where there are things packed together to where there are things scattered out from high concentration to low concentration. It tends to scatter things out. And so it's a one-way process with time. Well, now you can throw in a little bit more predictability. Uh, it also depends on how big the particles are. In fact, this is a crude way of estimating molecular weight of particles is just to see how fast they diffuse. Uh, the bigger the particle, the slower it diffuses, and the molecular weight is basically, uh, uh, the square root of the molecular weight is proportional to the diffusion speed. And so you can actually calculate roughly how big a particle is from how, how fast it diffuses. And it goes to a definite end point. And so here we're talking about individual mar uh, molecules you know, moving chaotically, and then you've got a high degree of predictability and order in a sense right now. It goes in one direction, from high to low. Uh, it goes at a rate that depends on the size of the particles and the temperature. Uh, and it goes to a definite endpoint. That is, it goes to equal scattering. 
you can say, uh, you know, as I'm shaking them back and forth, the fusion has ended. On average, there's six on each side, you know, eight, four, seven, and five, five and seven, but on average, six on the side. So diffusion has ended, but random molecular motion continues. <clears throat> well, even that, uh, God is able to capitalize on that chaos. Uh, and that's fairly phenomenal. A lot of uh, phenomena on living things depend on diffusion. And you might think, well, it's almost contradictory. Living things are characterized, you know, by a high degree of order. Things go on in a definite direction at a definite rate to a definite endpoint. And yet, uh, diffusion is based on molecules just blindly, you know, flailing around, not planning to go anywhere. And yet, that very simple process right there is uh, what's required to get oxygen from the lungs into the blood. And so, as you breathe in, uh, you know, the, the air that you breathe in is about 21% oxygen. The blood that's coming back to the lungs, uh, the oxygen that was uh, carried by the blood has been used up by cells uh, for metabolism, burn for energy, and things like that. And so the blood that's coming back into the lungs has less oxygen in it than it did before. And so as a result, oxygen molecules have no clue. When you breathe in oxygen molecules, they have no built-in desire to find a blood vessel and jump in, <laughs> grab hold of the hemoglobin molecule. They're not looking to go anywhere in particular. Uh, you know, they're just scattering out blindly. But as a result of that blind scattering out process, they're going to move from where there's a lot of them inside the air sac and the lung to where there's far less of them uh, in the blood. And so they'll automatically uh, diffuse in the designed direction. Well, now, as you might imagine, a diffusion is not a particularly rapid process. And so if you want, you know, if I want to go from here to the piano, you know, I can walk in a straight line, you know, and so you can kind of figure out how long it would take me to get there. But supposing instead, you know, you blindfolded me, spun me around, <laughs> you know, and I just had to water about a random until I got to the piano, I'd eventually get there, but it'd take a lot longer. And so diffusion takes a long time. Well, the blood is only in the lung for a fraction of a second. And so if you're going to load up the blood with oxygen, the distance between the air sac and the lung, you know, is crucial. It's got to be at the right distance for diffusion to be able to fill up or saturate the blood with oxygen. Guess what? The distance is ideal. <laughs> and so you have the real thin walls of the air sac right next to the real thin walls of the capillary with just a little bit of space in between them in the normal situation. What happens if that distance between the air sac and the lung increases? Death can result. <laughs> Illness can result for sure. What can make that happen? Well, a variety of things, and of course, some kind of lung infection, some kind of pneumonia. If you get a bacterial infection in the, in the lung, uh, then, of course, white blood cells come in, they, it tends to swell up and so on, fill with fluid, and so the distance between the lung and the blood is too great for the oxygen to get across. So you can suffocate uh, you know, from pneumonia. You actually die of suffocation in a way. Well, what can you do about it? Well, of course, you try to use antibiotics to get rid of the bacteria to reduce the inflammation so that the membranes come closer together. And uh, you use oxygen. In the old days, they used oxygen tents. Now they have other ways to increase the oxygen concentration then the more molecules trying to get across, even if the distance is too great normally, they'll still get across to keep you alive long enough for the antibiotic to, to work. And so it's very crucial, uh, you know, to, to have those distances exactly right. And that sets, you may wonder, you know, why are cells a certain size? And so there are maxima on how big a cell can be based on can materials that need to get from the outside to the inside of the cell, can they get there by diffusion fast enough? Uh, you know, plants have a way to compensate for that. They're bigger, uh, you know, than the average animal cell, but they have a stirring rod, you know, so you can put a lump of sugar in a cup of coffee, you know, and you wait for it to, you know, if you just take a sip, you know, it's bitter from the top, the sugar's still down the bottom. If you wait long enough, uh, the water molecules will pound the sugar cube to pieces and eventually spread it throughout the cup. 
But if you don't want to wait that long, what do you do? Take a spoon, okay? Stir it up, you know, and instantly it's like that. Well, plant cells have cytoplasmic streaming. Their, their insides actually continually circulating, and so they can maintain a larger cell size than animal cells can that don't have that internal stirring rod. And so there's all kinds of little uh, constraints and the features that God built in to capitalize on chaos. Here are all these oxygen molecules, for instance, all these water molecules just moving around at random with no particular purpose of their own that are serving the designed purpose and intent of their creator, the one who created them, and the one who created the system uh, to capitalize on this chaos. Uh, and a lot of things depend on that. The nerve impulses, you know, the nerve ending gets to a muscle or a gland, uh, there's a little gap at the end. And so what happens? Now the nerve impulse is kind of a chemoelectric signal that goes around the nerve membrane, but here's the end of the nerve membrane, here's the beginning of the muscle or gland, and so there's this little gap in there, like the synapse between one nerve and another, or the myoneural uh, junction between a muscle and a nerve. And so how are you going to get across that? Well, the answer is to dump uh, a, a signal like acetylcholine is a common one. There are several of these uh, chemicals that carry the impulse uh, from a nerve ending to another nerve ending or a muscle or a gland. Well, how do they get across? Well, they diffuse across. And so the gap, again, has to be the right distance. If it's too wide, the signal will never get there, uh, etc. So you have to have the distances just right and in this particular case, like in nerve impulses, uh, the amounts have to be right. And so in this little gap, uh, there's all the, the, say, the chemical that's being dumped in, the, the nerve signal transmitter, neurotransmitter, might be acetylcholine. Well, in that junction, there's a chemical, cholinesterase, an enzyme, whose job it is to break down acetylcholine, to destroy the neurotransmitter. And you might think, why would God put in a destructive enzyme like that? And the answer is so that when you bend your arm, you can quit. Otherwise, you bend your arm, you know, just go like that. You need a stop signal. So you need go and you need stop. And so this stuff is dumped into the nerve, in, uh, nerve gap and it diffuses across. Now that's where almost all the reaction time is. You know, when you were in driver ed, you know, how long between the time you see danger, you know, and you get your foot off the gas pedal and onto the brake. A lot of that delay is that diffusion delay, getting those neurons. It goes pretty fast down the nerve, in, nerve itself, but then that's where a lot of the delay is built in. Uh, and the amount's crucial. If you're only thinking about strangling your little sister for messing up whatever you just made, <laughs> there may not be enough of a signal dumped in there. The uh, breakdown enzyme, the cholinesterase, breaks it all down, and the signal doesn't really cross. Or if you're really, you know, committed to this action, you may dump a whole bunch of this in, and the impulse, you know, continues for a longer time. And then there are competing impulses. You could also have a strangler, no, don't strangler, you know, <laughs> chemical stimulators and inhibitors all fighting it out, you know, in terms of diffusion, uh, going across this little specially structured, uh, you know, sealed, uh, controlled uh, little gap. And so diffusion itself. Uh, plays an enormous number of roles in living things, thanks to what? The design of the system capitalizing on the random motion of the molecules involved. It's not the random motion. Now, the random motion couldn't do this if the membrane distances and the receptors and the stop signals and all that weren't part of the system. Diffusion doesn't get the credit. It's the designer who created a system that can harness uh, this kind of otherwise chaotic motion uh, that deserves the credit here. All right, well, that's uh, diffusion. Uh, can you see diffusion? And the answer is yes. Uh, in several different ways you can detect it. Uh, one, by the sense of smell. If I had a, a bottle of perfume up here, you know, it should have, you know, took off the top, you know, the first row would begin to pick up the aroma <laughs> and gradually would spread out over the room. Uh, so you can detect diffusion in ways like that. You can also see a kind of diffusion under the microscope, uh, Brownian motion, and sometimes you don't need a microscope. Now this has probably never happened to any of you, but you've probably heard about friends. 
uh, that were sitting in church and not paying as much attention as they ought. And, you know, here's a sunbeam coming into the window. And no matter how often the custodian goes over, there's always a little dust in the air. And so, you know, you look at the, you know, sunbeam going through here, and you'll see little dust particles uh, in the air. It's possible to get totally captivated by these. <laughs> you don't want to, or at least it shouldn't be in church. <laughs> but you can see these things. Now, there's kind of a drift. That's just air currents. You know, they might be flowing. But if you pick one particular little particle of dust and watch it, you know, it'll be down, bouncing around, up, down, backwards, forwards, left, right, toward you, away from you, just this random little dance. Uh, and named after Bill Browning, it's called Brownie in Motion. <laughs> You've all seen Bill dance around, right? <laughs> but at any rate, this is a phenomenal thing, and I just love watching this under the microscope. Uh, proteins are way too big to move under their own power. If you just look at proteins under the microscope, you know, they're just sitting there. They, they can't do anything. You put them in a solution of water, you don't see the water. But the impact of the water molecules on proteins or clumps of proteins or small dye particles or ground up leaves and so on uh, is such that you see this vibratory motion. And it just goes on and on and on and on and on. You know, room temperature just goes on forever until the particles break down so you can't see them anymore. And of course, uh, you can take these things. I used to have students make a little hanging drop uh, suspension and you put it on a hot plate for a few minutes or a few, a little bit. Uh, and then take it off, and now all these particles are dancing ever so much faster. And they stick it in the freezer for a few minutes, you know, and then stick it in there all, you know, now they're all slowed down. And so even though you don't see the random motion of water molecules, you see their effect uh, bouncing into uh, larger particles, just like the dust particles are not moving under their own power. They're being whapped by air molecules in the left, right, top, bottom, forward, backward, and being slapped around like that all the time. Well, Brownian motion is one of the most awesome forces in the universe. Uh, and it does two things. It makes life possible, and it kills you. Okay, So you can't live with it, you can't live without it. And so if you had no Brownian motion, in other words, you just freeze the cells so the water molecules weren't moving, there's no life. You can take the water out of it, freeze dry it. And if you take the water out of a living cell, you take the life out of a living cell. You put it in suspended animation. The particles just sit there, not interacting anymore. You add the water back, it's almost like adding life back. Now, you know, some evolutionists get carried away by this and think, oh boy, if there's a planet out there, a moon of Jupiter that has a drop of water on it, maybe there's life there. <laughs> now, water's necessary, but not sufficient. And so just finding water doesn't mean there's anything more there than water. Uh, but in order to find life there, as we understand it, you would have to find water among other things. And so that's uh, kind of crucial. But the other side of it is all this pounding by water molecules destroy structure. And so proteins only last a little while. Uh, red blood cells are about 280 million molecules of hemoglobin. And they last only about 120 days on average before they've accumulated so many defects that the liver and spleen filter them out before they get really bad. Uh, and so proteins are destroyed by this. You have to have the motion of water molecules to make interaction and life possible. But that same random motion destroys the structure you need for life. And so life is a juggling act. You have to keep constantly putting living things back together faster than the breakdown processes tear them apart. And so that's kind of a phenomenal thing that you can see. And it, it's so commonplace, a lot of people forget uh, the significance of it. Uh, it also has to do with uh, problems of scale. Uh, some of you, uh, you know, may remember, it's uh, pretty old now, but they made it a movie, Fantastic Voyage, uh, by Isaac Asimov. And, you know, a little team of scientists has shrunk down to miniature size and injected into the bloodstream, you know, and they, they navigate the bloodstream in this little uh, uh, tube, you know, and try, what are they, removing a tumor in the brain or something, or a clot? And, uh, you know, it's kind of neat science fiction, but it always kind of, uh, well, I don't know, I, the irritate wouldn't be right, but it was kind of comical to me that Asimov would criticize, you know, science fiction writers for Star Wars and this and that and the other for not being true to science. And yet his stuff was off and way off. If you really did shrink it, and of course there's places where, you know, white blood cells all glob on <laughs> this whole thing. If you really did shrink yourself down to that size, nobody would watch the movie. 
because everything would be going like this. You know? <laughs> and you would grab somebody and stop, stop, stop. You know? But at that size, there would be this constant random vibratory motion. And bacteria, bacteria are the size that experience that Brownian motion. And bacteria don't know the difference between up and down. Uh, and so bacteria in a solution of water are knocked around by the water molecules so much that they're equally up or down. Well, you say, aren't there bacteria that live in the muck at the bottom? And the answer is yes. Well, how do they know where the bottom is? And the answer is they have little magnets. They have magnets embedded in their cells, sensitive to the magnetic lines of force that curve downward, and they actually swim. That's how they know where down is. And they can actually swim down to get in the muck. They can't just fall down. They have no ability to fall down. And so if we actually shrank ourselves down to the size of bacteria, you would not be sitting in these pews. <laughs> you would be bouncing off the windows and rafters and floors. Who knows where I'd be? <laughs> And so it's, it's quite a wild world, uh, you know, at that particular dimension. Okay, well now, uh, let's uh, add another ingredient uh, to things. I'm just kind of, okay, here's kind of an average distribution. So I've got, uh, you know, six water molecules on the side. And as I mentioned, I've got a semi-permeable membrane here, one that lets these water molecules through. But it doesn't let protein molecules through. And so I would remember to bring a little sack of proteins with me. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to drop all the protein molecules in here. And uh, so this side now uh, would represent, with all these proteins in it, this might represent, you know, a living cell. It's got water in it. Uh, but it's also got some larger organic molecules, proteins and carbohydrates and, and so on and so forth. And then here's some water molecules outside the cell. So this could be you know, an amoeba in a pond or it could be a white blood cell in the, in the bloodstream. Are you ready for a quiz? Okay, I'm going to begin to add some temperatures. See, we're at absolute zero right now. <laughs> so I'm going to add some heat, start shaking this around, random you know, molecular motion. Uh, how many of them said there's two possibilities? Well, three. Well, most of the water molecules wind up on this side, where all the proteins are. Well, most of the water molecules, on average, wind up on this side, where there aren't any protein molecules, outside the cell or inside the cell. Or, well, water molecules diffuse according to their own diffusion, and they'll be equally on both sides. Okay, you ready? How many say the water molecules will accumulate on the side with all the proteins. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. How many say the water molecules will accumulate out here? It's not nearly as crowded. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 15, 16, 17, okay, almost twice as many, maybe 17 or 18. <laughs> How many of you think Water molecules don't care about the proteins. They'll be equal numbers on both sides. Okay. One, two, three, four, three. Oops. <laughs> almost the end of the experiment. <laughs> okay, well, that, that should, maybe I shouldn't have started this. Now, let's try the experiment. And if it doesn't, now it worked at home. <laughs> so if it doesn't work here, boy, it's pretty equally divided. You know, if it doesn't work here, then I'll tell you what should have happened. <laughs> okay, let's go. Let's, let's. Okay, the first time, there's only three left over here. So presumably there's nine over here. The water molecules are, seem to be accumulating on the crowded side, which is a little bit counterintuitive. But maybe I didn't shake right, so we'll keep it. <laughs> That's a little better for over there, maybe three, four, five. But still over here, more than that. <laughs> okay, well, since the experiment worked the way it's supposed to, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> <laughs> and at first, it seems a little counterintuitive. You know, this thing is already crowded. Why in the world would you have more water molecules over here and less water molecules out here? And, uh, well, there are a couple of ways of saying that. Uh, one is that every substance uh, diffuses, well, yeah, diffuses 
from its own high concentration to its own low concentration. And so out here, you know, in ordinary water, uh, the water was 100%. Inside the living cell, uh, living cells average about 80% water. And so water would diffuse from whether there's 100% water to where there's only 80% water. And so in a sense, the water molecules are diffusing from their own high concentration, 100%.